This is 101 on Plus TV Africa. On this episode, let's look at Nigeria after COVID-19 um, with entrepreneurs and thought leaders. The conversation would require we evaluate things by looking at where we were, where we are, and what the future holds. It's inexhaustible, but we must start somewhere. My name is Elsie Godwin. Our first guest is Chukwuka Chukwuma. Chukwuka is an investment banker, entrepreneur, and partner at Risk Horse Capital, a private investment and advisory firm. With a career spanning over 20 years, he sits on the board of several companies. He's committed to raising the economic potential of Africa through investments in human capital, the arts, technology, and infrastructure. Thank you, Chukuka, for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. This okay. very nice to be on your show. All right. So having done business in Nigeria, Africa, and of course, globally for many years, and I've heard you say you've studied Nigeria for a while. What have you recognized as our problems in Nigeria? I think that Nigeria has three problems. Um, I think that they are corruption, incompetence, and wickedness. The honest truth is that the only difference between a developed country um, and a developing country like ours is really the quality of the human resources that you deploy. You know, so if you put people in the right positions, they'll do well. Nigeria, um, if you start with the second problem, incompetence, a lot of people are not doing the right jobs that they should be doing. They're not living their God-given talents uh, within the context of what it is that they learned or whatever. A lot of us tend to go to school for parents' sake, so we tend to study the wrong things. Um, it's not where our passion lies, but hey, you, your parents have told you this is what you need to do. Um, and then you do, go get a job that you're not you know, passionate about, so you're not very good at it. Um, so that's one, one, one issue that is big. And then on top of that, we have this quota system, which absolutely makes no sense uh, because it's not merit driven. And so, you know, you have to force, you know, uh, if you come from Delta state versus you come from another state, you've got to force people into positions that um, they frankly are just not qualified for. Um, on the corruption side, we know what that problem is. Uh, there's always, you know, even in this COVID crisis, we're already discussing, you know, who stole or didn't steal um, allocated funds. Um, and then lastly, on the wickedness side, I mean, there are two, two world systems. You could have a system that is a, a country that is built on love, um, where, you know, the interests of the people are taken at hand. And, um, you know, they, they spend a lot of time and energy trying to make sure that they do calculations for things like um, uh, minimum wage, that the minimum wage is actually a minimum living wage, right? Um, we don't have any of those sorts of uh, concepts. So I'd say the three main problems are certainly corruption, incompetence, and wickedness, but there are um, a host of other things that uh, we need to fix. So how do we begin to fix these problems? I think the first thing is mindset. Um, and this isn't easy, right? Um, because we respect our elders, because of our traditional values um, and the power distance I just talked about, where we, you know, we respect power and almost um, in a godlike way, you know, uh, whether it's men of God or your father in your home or, um, you know, different uh, other uh, aspects. Um, we, we need to break from a lot of our traditions uh, that do not make sense. Um, um, we need to learn how to shame, uh, um, you know, members of our family um, who may not be, uh, may not have the right character. So, for instance, if your father's a thief or you have uh, kids that are doing Yahoo, do not celebrate them, right? Um, you know, those are things we can do while we wait for government, right? So I always look look at the mirror my, myself. I think we have to know what to invest in. So um, education is something that if you invest in it significantly, you will definitely get the returns. Healthcare, we're all learning, is also critical. Um, I remember when I sat in a bank uh, a couple of years ago, well, actually a long time ago now, because uh, I left banking in 2011. Um, but I remember being in a strategy session where we thought we had finished the discussion for the year about which industries and which customers to go after. So I asked, you know, me being a, a simple guy, I asked two questions. I said, what about healthcare and education? And some smart Alec in the corner who sat in risk 
and uh, was in charge of credit said to me, health and education are not things you invest in because one, healthcare, the cash flows are sick people, and two, the cash flows of education are, are kids. So how do you take security? How do you enforce security? How do you force them to pay you back? And I laughed. I laughed in a sarcastic way because I thought that was such a stupid, sad statement that he made. And one born out of someone who didn't understand how, uh, what social infrastructure is, which is things that you need that may not necessarily make you money, but you certainly need them. And now we're finding out that banks and we you know thank the likes of gtb access and a number of them that are you know going ahead and building hospitals in five days it's all fantastic but we could have done this a long time ago okay, we'll, we'll so those are some to, of the areas i think we could have helped with we'll come back to social infrastructure but you mentioned something while answering my previous question um, earlier you said um our, the respect our culture is affecting um, the way we do things and could be one of our problems. Um, but don't you think the concept of respect is something we have um, misunderstood in this part of the world? I mean, um, the reason why I mention respect is because we have a, an age-old tradition that says respect your elders. Um, but I'd like to adjust that. If your elder is a crook who is stealing your state blind or your father is a womanizer who's spending your entire um, herit, you know, inheritance, um, his, his money, but also the money that's supposed to come to you as the child. Why should you respect somebody like that? That's the question I'm asking, right? Do you respect an old person who has decided to become a, a kidnapper just because they are old, right? So the context is that you should not respect those that are thieves and those that essentially have ruined the country and um, essentially bankrupted us and put us in the situation that they're in just because they are older is in fact that problem that has led us down the path. We're still looking to 70, 80 year olds as guidance. As of course, you respect your parents, but you should certainly think twice about respecting a pedophile who happens to be older, right? Okay. All right, um, taking it back to social infrastructure, what is the state of infrastructural development and investment in Nigeria? Um, it's in shabby, you know, a very shabby state. Um, when you look at uh, all the different indices in terms of, um, I mean, just compare us to Ghana, when you think of the road network they've got there versus what we have. So road network as distinct from quality of roads in both indices we lose. Um, if you if you use the Millennium Development Goals, which have now turned into Sustainable uh, Development Goals, that's actually a very good one, because when you start looking at it, you you see things like uh, water, power, education, equality. You know, there's so many things on the list. Now, I don't know one of those that we've nailed and sort of are done with. I remember working in Ghana, and I hate comparing us to, say, a developed country because that, that gap is too much. Well, Ghana is right next door, and they now have a bigger FDI uh, than Nigeria does. So that's, a, you know, and they, they, you know for, uh, for lack of a better word, they're a close enough comparable to our region for us to be able to look internally and see what we're doing wrong. Um, we are not focused on um, doing the right things within the context of social infrastructure. So hospitals, um, education, uh, you know, I remember in, in my mother's days, she's in the eighties, you know, right now, when you went from Nigeria, um, abroad with a degree, um, from a Nigerian university, you know, you were head and shoulders above a lot of other people. That's not the case right now, right? Our educational system is in shambles and post COVID, we have a bigger issue with all these, um, things I just mentioned, because all of a sudden now, People are talking about e-learning and my kids that are in school abroad, uh, fortunate for me, I have no inter interruptions in their lives, right? But I know that there are tons of millions of kids who, first of all, were already out of school in Nigeria. And then secondly, those that were even in school, uh, but not in very good schools and certainly didn't have any plans for, you know, internet, um, uh, going to school online and, and trying to, uh, uh, you know, finish this semester, are already going to be behind by a significant amount. So if you look at Lagos as a wonderful city, so sort of look at, you know, commercial city for the entire Nigeria, as developed as it is, it probably has infrastructure for no more than, I don't know, six to seven million people. 
um, but we are 21, uh, or so, so they tell us. Um, and so this is a very, very big challenge, right? If your main city is being blocked by, you know, one trailer has an accident on third main, and all of a sudden, you know, people can't get home for six hours. I mean, if you had two hours uh, to three hours guaranteed um, every day in traffic, you know, in six months, you could probably finish an MBA, right? But instead, you're wasting your life uh, in traffic. So there's so many things. Uh, when you say for social infrastructure, I mean, healthcare is just a, a shambles. You know, we, we talk about um, diagnostics, right? So diagnosing what is wrong with you is extremely critical, right, for you to be treated. Okay. So, right? so I'm saying in treating these um, um, issues or the diagnosed problem, because I don't think we need to wait for diagnosis because we actually know what our problems are. <laughs> what factors should Absolutely. we let drive our direction? What, are, what should be the defining factors? I mean, the defining factor is the people's will, you would imagine, right? So if the people want something in a normal country. So if you look at the Arab Springs, right, they had hospitals, they had schools, they actually were much better than we are. But the people willed that, you know what, Mubarak, all these guys is not enough. We want better. And they kicked them out. Nigerians, are we ready, are we willing and ready to will our will, like, like to actually act on what it is we want. First of all, what it is we do is it that we want? I'm not sure that we know. Um, I think we want a better, you know, life. But for every time there's an election and you have the choice of choosing, and I won't mention any candidates, clearly better candidates, they say the better candidates are young, or they say the better candidates are, speak too much English, or they say the better candidates don't speak the local language. And then they choose the old guy that they've known to be terrible and incompetent and potentially wicked. And then they complain later that they're in a, in a bad situation. Well, I know you are a finance man. So um, there is a video circulating on social media of um, Cross River State Governor Ben Ayade as he inaugurates his um, anti-tax agency. Now, basically, he's exempting small business owners, petty traders, small-scale farmers, and um, the vulnerable in society from paying tax. He says the government has got no right to collect tax from people they don't necessarily cater to. How do you react to this um, development? Yeah, so I saw the video and I, I actually, you know, mixed feelings. But I think on one side, I think Ayade and his government are doing a great job within the context of giving a break to people that, frankly, can't afford to pay him anything because they are in the almost subsistence farming slash survival you know, they're barely kind of making it, right? The money that they make is just enough to, you know, feed the family, take care of the kids. They're not balling, right? Um, you have uh, many other industries in his state, the banking and a couple others that he could go after. Um, so I think that is a very laudable um, initiative. Why I'm laughing is that when acts of love are sold, are, are exposed in Nigeria, a lot of times you find that um, there is an almost implicit requirement to clap for the person. That's the part I don't like, right? Because that's exactly what he should be doing during COVID, right? So if you sort of look at, you know, in fact, he should have done that before COVID, right? It's not a COVID thing, right? Because they were already suffering. And uh, they were only, they're going to suffer more now that, you know, supply chain has been affected. So, so that's why it's, it, for me, it's a bit tongue in cheek. The, the governments have already bankrupted the state and there's no new revenue. So the least you can do if you can't make new revenue for the state is reduce the costs for the people. And that's the right move for him to do. So I applaud him and I wish other states would do the same. If you said that's the right thing and you just said you wish other states to do the same, will it be financially advisable to expect the same in a place like um, Lagos State? I mean, <laughs> Lagos State is in a much better situation than uh, than uh, 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 Ayade State, right? By far, right? Um, and I think Lagos State. I mean, I feel, uh, look, I've done a lot of work for Lagos State, and I love the state. That is indeed, even though I'm from Delta, state of origin, I am a Lagosian um, and grew up there my entire life, and had had the privilege of working for a number of governments uh, in their project finance deals. Now. Um, I know that they have a financial model that 
has a line. I think PwC built it for them. It has like 99 taxes, lines of taxes, you know. And I've also been at the other side of their spare when they send their touts and area boys and policemen to your office claiming that if you don't pay TV tax equivalent to the same amount that Slumbershay paid, even though you're a very small business, that they're going to lock you up, right? So I've seen Lagos State from both sides. And what I can say is that, yes, they can do more for their indigent. Yeah, well, we'll have to go. Thank you so much. I will hope to have you again uh, soon. Well, thank you for having me. This was awesome. Thank you very much, Elsie, and have a good day. You too. It's time for a quick break, but when we return, we'll be joined by an entrepreneur who has paid his dues and is readily sharing his story to help mentor the younger generation.